Hi, my name is Brian Dagenhart, and I'm Managing Editor at Meaning of Life TV. I'm thrilled to have with me today Steve Silberman, veteran journalist who recently released his first book, Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity, which will debut at number eight on the September 13th New York Times bestsellers list. I'm also joined by Dr. Temple Grandin, professor of animal science at Colorado State University and prominent autism advocate who's been writing about her own experiences as a person with autism for 30 years. Today, we're going to be discussing the evolution of the diagnosis of autism, which Steve chronicles br brilliantly in his book, Neurodiversity as an Approach to Learning and Disability, and about neurologist and author Oliver Sacks, who died August 30th. Ollie, as his friends like our guests today knew him by, was instrumental in bringing awareness of the full spectrum of autism to the general public through his books, as well as by serving as an advisor to Dustin Hoffman when he developed the role of Raymond Babbitt for the movie Rain Man. Steve, you've said that what inspired your interest in autism initially was Sachs's profile of artist Stephen Wilshire and our guest Temple Grandin in his 1995 book, An Anthropologist on Mars. Uh, Temple, could you tell us about your first meeting with Oliver and how accurately he portrayed your manifestations of common characteristics of autism? Well, when I was a little kid, uh, two and a half years old, I had no speech, I had severe symptoms of autism. Uh, one of the problems in autism is it kept changing the uh, the diagnosis all the time. They've really broadened it. In fact, I go over the whole history of the DSM in my book, uh, The Autistic Brain. Um, Oliver really got inside my head. He got inside my head in a way that, um, you know, nobody else uh, did. And I, I remember the visit really, really well. In fact, I got a call from Wired Magazine and they asked me, what are some of the things I remember about the visit? And the first thing I remembered was the fact checker from the New Yorker magazine. And what I learned from this, looking back on it, is Oliver is a total verbal thinker. Um, he got all my emotions. It's from what I said. Not from things he saw, but what I said. Because the fact checker I informed me that I had a single, just a single house. I don't have a single house. I live in a triplex with three doors right next to each other. You know, that's a big visual mistake. That got corrected by the fact checker. You know, there's, and one thing I talk about in a lot of my writings now is the different kinds of minds. Visual thinkers, Pattern math thinkers, verbal thinkers. Oliver is more of a verbal, emotional thinker. And he totally remembered everything that I said. That's the way his mind works. Steve, autism hasn't always been understood as broadly as it is today. And for that reason, it was thought to be extremely rare. But the broadening of the definition, particularly in the DSM, as Temple pointed out, uh, has led to a large increase in the number of diagnoses, um, which had been attributed to things like vaccinations, which was based on a now discredited study, uh, and other environmental factors of the modern world. But why was the definition so narrow to begin with? The man who described autism so narrowly to begin with uh, was uh, the guy who discovered autism in 1943, a child psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins Hospital named Leo Connor. And Leo Connor was trying to, to launch child psychiatry as an empirical field of science at Johns Hopkins. And so what he saw in autism was uh, the first form of substance that was endemic to early childhood. That's how he framed it. And he saw it as very rare. Um, and he really had a, a very limited uh, concept of autism at the beginning. Adults weren't even on his radar, which wasn't really his fault because he was a child psychiatrist. Um, he would eventually theorize that autism was caused by cold and unaffectionate parenting, so-called refrigerator mothers, which of course was a disaster for autistic people and their family, uh, and their families, as I explore in depth in my book. But the truth of the matter is, even though Leo Connor took credit for discovering autism in 1943, he really wasn't the person who discovered autism. That would have been Hans Asperger in the 1930s. He was a, uh, a clinician at the University of Vienna Hospital who started seeing autistic patients in the 1930s. He saw more than 200 children uh, eventually at all levels of ability from people who could not speak and would probably require care for the rest of their lives to uh, very chatty, 
uh, kids who were very into science and chemistry. In fact, he described one kid as stealing money to furnish his chemistry set, actually. Um, and so uh, Asperger also understood that autistic children grow up to become autistic adults. And one of his very autistic young patients, uh, in fact, begged his teachers to give him advanced classes in science and math he went on to uh, graduate school where he detected an error in one of Isaac Newton's proofs and then went on to become an assistant professor of astronomy. So Asperger had a very, very prescient conception of what we now call the autism spectrum and what his assistant, George Frankel, called the uh, autism continuum. So they were two completely different conceptions of autism, um, but they were not, as is often thought, two completely different groups of patients. Uh, people have for a long time assumed that Connor only saw low-functioning autistic people, which is a phrase I, I avoid using because low-functioning autistic people, quote-unquote, often have talents and abilities that are not obvious uh, to the outside, whereas so-called high-functioning autistic people are often struggling in ways that are invisible uh, to the casual observer. So uh, sort of this myth got created that the two doctors had seen uh, two completely different populations of patients. And another myth that, that Connor himself created was that his discovery of autism was completely independent from Asperger's. What I discovered uh, while researching my book is that, in fact, Asperger's chief diagnostician, a guy named George Frankel, who was Jewish, was rescued from the Holocaust by Leo Connor and brought over to Baltimore, where he became the head of uh, a clinic that Connor worked with at Johns Hopkins. And it was actually George Frankel who evaluated Connor's first three autistic patients. So the two discoveries were not at all independent. Both of them were informed by the expertise of uh, Asperger and Frankel and their colleagues in Vienna. And not only was George Frankel hanging around Connor when he made that discovery, but Annie Weiss, who became Annie Weiss Frankel, George's wife, was also one of Asperger's core team. And in fact, my uh, chapter in the book that talks about Asperger's work begins with a case history of uh, the first autistic person really described in Asperger's clinic uh, that was written by Annie Frankel. So um, basically, Connor had the all the combined brain power of Asperger's team in Baltimore when he quote-unquote discovered autism several years after Asperger did. So uh, that's an interesting historical mystery that I was able to finally solve. So um, that history uh, went undiscovered, uh, Asperger's work, for a period of another 40 years? Yeah, exa uh, until, exactly. Until, mm -hmm. until Lorna Wing, uh, a, a British uh, neurologist, rediscovered that and, and brought it to light. Um, exactly. And, and that the primary reason for that is that Connor never once mentioned Asperger's work in his voluminous writings on autism. And uh, I, I found this truly shocking, although I, I have a potential explanation for it. But uh, the only time that Leo Connor ever mentioned Asperger's work in public was in a very dismissive uh, book review in the 1970s where he said, oh, yes, Asperger. What that man discovered was, at best, a 42nd cousin of my syndrome and has already received attention from serious investigators. So... Even though Connor did give George Frankel credit in his landmark 1943 paper for evaluating his first autistic patients, he never mentioned Asperger's work. So historians have sort of been making excuses for Connor ever since. They, they say, well, well um, uh, Connor you know, didn't read the paper because it was written in German. Well, it turns out that German was Connor's native language. Um, they say, well, Connor overlooked Asperger's paper because it was published in this obscure German medical journal. Well, it was a German journal that Connor cited several times in his work, so Connor was certainly familiar with it. Connor famously obsessively read 
every paper written on autism that he could get his hands on, particularly in the early years. So what are the chances that he would have overlooked the one major paper on the subject that was written a year after his own? Very slim. But the reason why I think Connor might have attempted to, in a sense, bury Asperger in history, and thus also bury knowledge of the autism spectrum until Lorna Wing found it again, was Connor, like George Frankel, was Jewish. And Asperger's bosses in Vienna were Nazis, because the Nazis had marched into Austria in 1938 to claim Austria as part of the German fatherland. And um, Asperger himself was not a Nazi. He was a member of a uh, Christian youth group that was very anti-Nazi and, in fact, had been banned by Nazis. But uh, Connor might have felt that, you know, Asperger was part of history that he, that he did not want the world to remember. But I'm just speculating there. I really have no idea why Connor, you know, in other words, I don't think it was just as simple as Connor sort of suppressing knowledge of the competition, but because I wasn't able to interview Connor for my book, I don't know really why he did that. But the problem is that by suppressing knowledge of Asperger's paper, he suppressed knowledge of the autism spectrum until, as you say, Lorna Wing found it again in the 1970s I just want to, and 80s. I want to break in and make a comment. This is a really good point about the autism spectrum, because you read Can Connor's paper, autism only had speech delay with obvious severe symptoms in a very young child. Where with Asperger's syndrome, there's no speech delay. So you put the two together, you get the whole spectrum. In fact, the DSM-5 today has put the thing, in, put autism in such a big spectrum today that uh, uh, there's a point where you have Einstein and Tesla and uh, Steve Jobs uh, merging in all the geeks and nerds on one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, you have somebody where severe symptoms show up at a young age. That would be me. I was not fully verbal until age four, and I had all the full um, autistic symptoms. I can remember the frustration of not being able to talk. Fortunately, I got into very good early intervention in a little nursery school that did ABA type of therapy. Uh, lots of turn-taking games. You've got to teach these kids how to take turns. In the 50s, manners were taught in a really structured manner. That really helped me. And then my ability in art was always encouraged. You see, art became the basis of uh, designing livestock facilities as the field of industrial design. Now, Temple, I, I, I want to jump in here myself because I think this is such an important point because one of the arguments that is continuously dividing uh, the autism community, is people say, well, my child is not like Temple Grandin. My child is not going to grow up to get a PhD and become a professor of animal science. I, I would love it if you could really make the point that when you were a child, you were, you were suffering from many of the problems and also uh, suffering from people's reaction to you, in a sense, um, that children who are seen as profoundly impaired are suffering from? Well, when little, I think one of the reasons why the spectrum got so big is when kids are two years old, three years old, I looked really totally terrible. But after lots of therapy, by age four and a half to five, I became fully verbal. And then there's other children, unfortunately, and no matter how hard you work on them when they're little, they remain with a lot of handicaps. Now, one of the things I was tested for when I was uh, two and a half years old by Bronson Crothers a neurologist at Boston Children's Hospital, was to see if I had petite, mal, epilepsy, and deafness. Those are the only tests they could do in 1949 when I would have been tested. Now, there's some other children that, are, that remain much more severe. Often they show other neurological symptoms like epilepsy. I did not um, show that. But there are uh, individuals, unfortunately, even after lots of therapy, they still would have to live in a completely um, supervised living situation. Um, there are some families, I've talked to them, where they cannot do any normal activities with a child, like go to a restaurant, a movie, or, or a football game, or the grocery store. Yep, I understand. Although I have to say one of the, one of the main characters in my book is a nonverbal kid named Leo Rosa. And, you know, he has meltdowns, and he's primarily non-speaking and stuff. But his parents have taken a very, very positive attitude, as your mom did, Temple. And I feel like a, a, a taking a positive attitude, even in the face of really serious disabilities, is very, very important. 
Well, I definitely would agree with that. Um, yesterday, I was at a maker fair down at the Boulder Fairgrounds where they bring in lots of kids, uh, play with robots, play with cardboard boxes. And there were some kids there that were definitely on the milder end of the autism spectrum, having a great time cutting up boxes and making forts out of them. It was great to see not a single kid there looking at a phone unless it was used as a remote control for a robot. And there were some of the more milder kind of um, kind of kids. Now, one bad thing I'm seeing happening in schools is I'm seeing a child that ought to be in that advanced math class, ought to be doing a lot of um, really advanced schooling, put into a class with kids with more problems and not learning how to read. And that's not a very good situation. Mm. Yeah, there's something about hands-on learning that seems to really appeal to autistic kids, including you. You really, uh, in a sense, began your career by building your squeeze machine and by being supported by Bill Carlock, correct? Well, and when I was a little kid, I made bird kites that I flew behind my trike that had wingtips like a jet airplane, and I experimented and experimented and experimented. Also at this Maker's Fair, they had my same second and third grade kind of paper and paste and popsicle stick kind of projects, along with the robots and the high-tech stuff. And boy, the kids were loving the low-tech stuff that they've taken out of all the elementary schools. You know, things like cutting out paper snowflakes. And the boxes were a gigantic hit. That's fantastic. And that's something else, uh, by the way, I want to point out that differed between Connor and Asperger in a really crucial way. Asperger noticed that his kids were really into doing chemistry experiments. They were dreaming of rocket ships, even before rocket ships were really a practical thing. And in fact, he ended up taking back something that he'd written, because in the early days, he said something like, by noting the fascination of autistic children for rocket ships, we can see how remote from reality autistic interests truly really are. Well, 10 years later, when the whole world was obsessed with rocket ships, he had to take that back. And... Uh, so Asperger saw in the interests of his kids a potential foundation for building a future career and a future role in society. And I think, and he, that, and I think that's really, really super important. I've made several trips to NASA. I've talked to a lot of retired NASA space scientists who have grandkids with autism. And you know what those NASA space scientists tell me? That half the people at NASA and the engineers are probably on the autism spectrum. We I know. And without them. Absolutely. And in fact, one of the characters in my book that I really ended up loving was this kid who was called Tommy the Space Child by his psychotherapist. And he unfortunately grew up during the time when years and years of psychoanalysis was the prescription for both uh, autistic kids and their parents. And so this kid was, was psychoanalyzed for like 1,500 hours of psychoanalysis where they were interpreting his uh, interest in science fiction as like frustrated, uh, violent fantasies against his parents or some nonsense like that. A anyway, he ended up getting um, adopted by a foster family who gave him the space to be the way he was and to be interested in what he was interested in. And by the end of his story, he wants to join the research organization that eventually became NASA. Well, and then your book also covers Cavendish, who discovered the principles of electricity. And then there's Tesla, who invented the power plant. He would definitely be on the spectrum. Yeah. And, you know, it is worth pointing out that one reason, the, the only reason, actually, why Henry Cavendish was able to lay the foundation for several fields of modern science, like he almost transcends the word scientist because he worked in so many different fields and pioneered them, was because he came from a, a well-to-do family and he was able to build this estate on Clapham Common near London, which I describe in depth because it's so cool. He was basically like a 21st century maker, as we would call him now, but living, you know, in the, in the 18th century. And so his house was full of uh, chemistry equipment and rain gauges and thermometers. He had hundreds of thermometers. When he went on a road trip in a carriage, he built what he called a way wiser to measure the number of miles that he traveled, and he would stop and take it, the temperature of every well that he passed. And he was really an amazing guy, but think about it. If he hadn't been born into one of the wealthiest families in England, he undoubtedly would have been sent to Bethlehem Royal Hospital which was known as Bedlam, uh, because he would have been considered insane. Uh, 
because he was not able to to be at ease in social situations. He didn't look people in the eye. He would stand off to the side and listen to them uh, kind of almost eavesdropping on what they were saying. But he was absolutely brilliant. And so, you know, I think one of the saddest truths that I came across in writing my book was that families of, like families of color and impoverished families, they didn't have a chance of even getting an autism diagnosis for most of the 20th century. Their kids would often end up branded as quote unquote mentally retarded well, or intellect. To talk about some of the things that, um, you know, that I've observed. I've been involved with the building trades, especially on steel and concrete construction for 20 years. Would go out and I would design a handling facility, then I go supervise its construction. And there were a lot of quirky kind of people that were really good millwrights and welders. They were straight out of the trailer park. And what saved them were the hands-on skilled trades. And I think one of the worst things the schools have done is taking out all the skilled trades like auto mechanic, welder, and machinist. Because we actually have a shortage for those kind of people. And some of these people I worked with, I, they're, some of them are my age, some of them are now 10 years younger. They would definitely be diagnosed on the spectrum today if they were kids. Temple, I wanted to ask you, um, because you sort of came of age at a time before the diagnosis was really available to adults, like I was, I was um, quite struck by the fact that your autobiography, Emergence, which came out in uh, the late 80s, you were introduced as the first recovered autistic person. And, you know, that label didn't stick because you eventually realized that you were still very autistic, but an autistic adult. What was it like to realize that you were an autistic adult before that concept really existed in psychiatry? Well, there was very little um, information. Of course, I read everything. And when I first started out in my career in the 70s, when I was in my 20s, uh, the biggest problem I had was a woman going into a man's world. And I oh, think wow. in some ways, yeah. they, um, autism actually helped me because I had a drive and a, and a motivation I, you know, then of course there was the famous Oliver Sacks interview, and then I did my second book, um, Thinking in Pictures, which was my, we talked about how I totally think in pictures, I don't think in words. I, you know, gradually learned more and more, but I was um, reading everything I could lay my hands on, uh, but, you know, not many people outside my friends knew about it. Do you remember seeing Rain Man and what you thought of it? Yes, in fact, I had a lunch with, with uh, Dustin Hoffman where I explained to him what autism felt like. He used, um, uh, oh, that's terrible, I'm very bad on names. Another person, uh, uh, Ruth Sullivan's son. You know, yeah, Joe show, Sullivan. Joe yeah. Su Ruth Sullivan's son to show what autism looked like. I explained to, Ram to, um, to um, Dustin Hoffman what autism felt like. I talked about the extreme anxiety all the time, the sensory problems. I said, Dustin, just imagine what your first big, important breakthrough audition was like and how nervous you were. That's the way I felt all the time. Imagine that loud sound like, a, a, you know, the school bell going off, hurts your ear like a dentist drilled down your ear. You know, being touched was just too overwhelmingly overstimulating. I really emphasized the sensory. And they got that just beautifully in the movie. That's fantastic. Yeah, it was really, I, I was, I talked to, uh, Joe Sullivan's mom, Ruth, who was really a hero, one of the founders of the autism parents movement in America with, uh, Bernie Rimland. And, um, I remember that Ruth said that before Rain Man came out, she would constantly have to explain to people that her son was not artistic, yes. as they thought they heard her say, but autistic. But then almost immediately, like within, you know, within days, really, of the movie coming out, suddenly perfect strangers who knew nothing about autism now suddenly could recognize it in her son. That was really a, a striking truth. Well, and of course, um, you know, Raymond Babbitt in the movie was a savant type of autistic. You know, I'm definitely not a, a number savant. I'm, you know, now that, but the biggest thing that shows up in autism, I have problems with remembering faces. I know Oliver Sacks has exactly that same problem. Uh, and, and some of the social circuits just aren't hooked up. But being brought up in the 50s, they pounded those social skills in. And other people of my generation that were in things like skilled trades, they pounded in enough social skills, so they were able to run the maintenance department at a large meatpacking plant and not get fired, and they just stay away from the suits in the office and have their picnic table out in the maintenance shop. And they're probably all on the spectrum. There's a mechanic that I've seen working on the airplanes that I see him 
long-haired hippie. Oh, he's probably on the spectrum, too. Probably the best mechanic they've got. That was a point that Lorna Wing uh, made. I, I had a wonderful interview with her. We were supposed to talk for about half an hour because she was quite elderly by then, and she had already been through uh, the deaths of both her husband and her autistic daughter, Susie. But she was totally perky and spunky and sharp as a tack, and I ended up talking to her all afternoon. And she said that she thought that um, making the Asperger syndrome uh, diagnosis available had really just made visible a whole huge group of people who had always been a part of British society, but in a sense they would often have their wives sort of covering for them and doing the social skills stuff for the couple. Um, and that she thought that one of the things that had changed was that as, as women got their own careers and became sort of less willing to be, you know, just their husband's sidekick in a sexist society, that in a sense that made the guys more aware that they were having difficulty uh, in the social world. I thought that was a fascinating insight. Well, there are a lot of people who just sort of, you know, didn't fit in. Because now when you got the Asperger's diagnosis, now you could be on the autism spectrum with no speech delay. Where prior to that, at least in the U.S., you know, in the U.S. using the DSM to be labeled autistic, on, um, you know, prior to the early 90s, you had to have obvious speech delay. You know, now the speech delay has been taken out and you've got this huge spectrum going from half the geeks on Silicon Valley, and they avoid the diagnosis. In fact, I saw a young kid yesterday playing in the boxes and just having a great time. And they go, oh, we know he's on the spectrum. We're going to keep him off the diagnosis. He was a great time with the boxes, and he built really neat things. I said, this kid needs to be building things. And then he's not going to have problems with hyperactivity. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, obviously at Wired, I, I, you know, I wrote for Wired for a very long time, and I, I met a lot of people on the spectrum. I remember one time I went to... Uh, this very sort of high class dinner. And, uh, I saw this kid there who was obviously autistic and, you know, he was sort of stimming and, and staying off to himself. And I thought to myself, oh, he must be the autistic son of some big shot who's at this dinner. And I later found out that he was the CTO of one of the biggest companies in Silicon Valley. So that, that was very interesting to me. Well, there's an old article that, uh, on, appeared in Time Magazine. In fact, I found it in my files just the other day comparing the um, Oliver Sacks New Yorker piece in 1994 on me with Bill Gates, comparing traits like repetitive behavior. Uh, you know, I saw those old Bill Gates depositions. I don't know if they're available online or not, but he wrote, when he's confronted about killing Netscape, he starts rocking like this. I hope I don't crash Net, uh, Skype right now. <laughs> he starts rocking like this during that deposition. But he's changed a lot. The thing about Asperger's is you keep changing. People tell me that my talks at age um, 60 are better than my talks at age 50. You keep developing. You keep learning. This is why it's so important to get these kids out doing things. I'm seeing too many of them becoming recluses in their rooms with video games rather than yeah, getting yeah. that good job in skilled trades or getting a job coding at Silicon Valley. Yeah, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Temple, John Elder Robeson, has yes. also talked about how his brain has really developed in middle yes. age and yes. how he feels like his skill set has really expanded since becoming the best-selling author of Look Me in the Eye. Well, I would totally agree with that. You keep on developing. You know, and in a lot of my writings, I've also written about that. You know, it wasn't until I was about 50 that I really thought that I'd become a full-fledged adult. Definitely. Yep. Uh, and, Temple, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Go no, ahead. I was going to ask you, how did you first hear of Oliver Sacks? Well, Oliver Sacks, I knew about his book, um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and um, he was researching autism, and he called me, and he said he wanted to come out and interview me, and I said, great. And uh, there's the famous time when we went up to Estes Park, and I had to stop him from jumping in the lake. He would have died. Mm -hmm because the lake was uh, in front of a dam, and he would have been killed if he'd gone over that dam, and I stopped him. Uh, and great. I remember Thank that you. because it, would have been, it was super, super dangerous to swim in that river right at that place where he wanted to go. Yeah. He swam every day for most of his life. Yes, I he think. did, yeah. and we put him up at a hotel, didn't have a big enough pool. I had to take him down to the city pool and arrange for a taxi to bring him back to the hotel after he swum laps in the city pool. Um, but I'll never forget that I'm um, stopping him from jumping in that lake. I mean, 
he wouldn't he wouldn't have written he would have died if he, he could have died if he'd gone in that lake. Steve, you have a pretty interesting story. I think I think about the first time that you met um, Oliver Sacks after you published uh, the article that you you lead your your book with uh, the Geek Syndrome, which I think it was two thousand one. You published in Wired. Yeah, absolutely. Um, about yeah, and I don't and I don't really lead with the article. I I talk about it because I think I was focusing too narrowly on uh, Silicon Valley. But yeah, I mean, it was a, it was an amazing chain of events that led to our meeting. I was in the airport flying to New York City when I got a call from Kate Edgar, Oliver's longtime assistant and editor, saying that Oliver had read The Geek Syndrome and he loved it. He thought it was great. And so I said, well, where do you guys live? And she said, well, we live in Greenwich Village. And I said, well, why don't I come down and see you? I had no idea that I was just sort of inviting myself, you know, to go see Oliver Sacks. But, you know, I, I'm, I guess I have chutzpah. So I went down to his office, and there was Oliver in his bathing suit, I have to say, because he had just been swimming. And uh, he, you know, thanked me for the article and said he really liked it, which, of course, was an incredible honor. And then he happened to mention that he was going to London in a few days because he was doing a promotional tour for his memoir, Uncle Tungsten. And because I didn't know him, because I was, in a sense, incredibly naive about Oliver, I said, hey, Oliver, that sounds great. Why don't I go with you? And believe it or not, he said yes. And so I called Wired and I said, oh, my God, you know, I, I just got Oliver Sacks to say that I could come with him to London. So I have to write a profile. And I actually had to argue um, you know, for them to accept that idea, but uh, they eventually did, and so I didn't actually fly with Oliver, but I met him there. We spent a couple of days together. It was completely amazing. We went to um, the Science Museum in South Kensington, and he gave me sort of Oliver Sacks' guided tour of the Science Museum, which I surely wish uh, I had been able to tape, but I didn't have a tape recorder with me. But anyway, it was a wonderful, wonderful time, and you know, next to him, I felt like a, an ignoramus, basically, because he had one of the greatest minds of, uh, that I've ever come across. Um, and then things got intense, because in the course of writing the profile of him, I figured out that he was a closeted gay man, and I'm gay myself. And he called me up, and he was very worried that I was going to out him. And uh, I had reassured him that I would not out him. But in, in a sense, on that basis... We ended up becoming friends, and uh, he became a very good friend of both me and my husband, Keith. And I think we helped him, in a sense, deal with his own eccentricity, as he, is, as he had helped so many people over the years with many different kinds of eccentricities. And he eventually came out um, in his most recent book, On the Move, which is a beautiful book. And he also, much to his surprise, fell in love near, you know, in the last few years of his life with this fantastic guy named Billy Hayes, who's a brilliant writer and photographer. And they traveled all over the world, and uh, Billy was with Oliver uh, when he died in his apartment, as was Kate. And so Oliver's you know, own sort of tragic story of being a closeted gay man, who was always assumed that he was celibate because he was closeted, it ended in the best possible way with him finding love and also coming out to the world and on the move. Another thing I want to mention about Oliver, because um, my mother lives in New York, and my um, brothers and sisters live in the New York area, so I'd go back Christmas to visit, and then we'd go visit Oliver. Sometimes Rosalie Bernard, photographer, would come with me. And one thing about Oliver is extremely kind person, a really, oh, yes. really kind person, a gentle, kind of absent-minded professor, extremely uh, kind man. We'd go visit his apartment, and he had all these different, um, you know, uh, types of minerals and things there, cuttlefish, and he'd love to talk about those things, but he's just incredibly kind. Didn't you love how he would become like an excited little kid when he would yes. bring out his minerals? Yeah, yes. it was it, yes. it was so, so adorable. And, um, and I also... Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I get a problem with the lag. I'm figuring when to break in. You know, yeah. then uh, we went to party, a book party that was given for Oliver, and they had balloons filled with argon that were really heavy. He thought <laughs> wow. that was really cool. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, one of my favorite Oliver anecdotes, we were in a like a health food store, more or less, and I saw this bunch of sage with very furry leaves, and I knew that among the many fields of science that Oliver was fascinated by was botany, and so I said to him, Oliver, I wonder why sage has such furry leaves, and he said, 
because they like it. Well, I had somebody ask me one time, one cattle lick their noses, um, why they stick their tongues up their noses, and I just told them because they can do it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, a, a point that I make in Oliver's book was that when he first saw autistic people on uh, Ward 23 at Bronx Psychiatric, um, he was very concerned that they were uh, dehumanized by the staff. They were put in straitjackets, in isolation rooms, left to lie in their own waste for days on end. Uh, the staff would call them idiots to their face. Um, and Oliver, of course, saw these incredible talents in them that he wrote about in, uh, in uh, Man Who Took His Wife for a Hat, an anthropologist on Mars. And he actually objected to the brutal treatment of uh, the people in Ward 23, and he was quickly transferred off the ward um, because uh, that wasn't done. You just didn't object to behavior modification and the other uh, really brutal forms of treatment that were, and not treatment, but more like horrible custodial care. And this was the situation of autistic people for a couple of generations. I mean, the, the kids who would have been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome just had to struggle by without a diagnosis usually, but the really profoundly impaired autistic people would be put in institutions. And so, you know, people who are convinced that vaccines cause autism, they often say, well, where were, where were the autistic adults? Why did I never hear of autism when I, was, when I was growing up? One reason is because they were hidden away in institutions and their families were not only blamed for causing the kids autism, but they were actively discouraged from talking about uh, the existence of their own children after they put them in institutions. Well, so it's like uh, something yeah. that my mother said. Uh, one of the things that helped my mother find a good uh, boarding school for me after I got kicked out of ninth grade for fighting after being bullied and teased. Uh, mother as journalist for the what what is now NPR, um, you know, a TV and radio was doing a, a documentary on uh, retarded children. That's what it was caused called back then in the 50s, and emotionally disturbed children, so she got to see the schools as a journalist. But one of the things that made her decide she was going to absolutely keep me out of an institution was she went to the autistic ward at some hospital around in the Boston area. She said it was just horrible. It was completely silent, and they were just all sitting there stimming, and it was the most terrible thing, and boy, she was going to make sure I didn't end up there. Yeah, absolutely. I remember uh, one of the articles that was written about an autism clinic at UCLA remarked that these children do not have toys because such children do not play. Well, as you know, autistic children play in their own ways. Um, and so the, the ideas that came out of the institutionalization of uh, autistic people, which was a direct result of the theory uh, of Connors, uh, then later picked up by Bruno Bettelheim and amplified into the refrigerator mother theory. It, the institutionalization was a direct result of that theory because the, the idea was to remove the child from the allegedly toxic family environment that had caused the autism and that the horrible effects of that just cascaded down through at least two generations of autistic children. I was totally sure when I... You know, at the Maker Fair that I just came back from, there was one little boy there that was uh, diagnosed as mildly autistic. And the thing that I noticed is he was cutting the boxes up with hacksaw blades and taping cardboard together, is he was building something really neat and professional looking. He was only 11 years old. The other kids were just kind of hacking the boxes up. But this little kid was building something really good. And I said to his mom, I said, this kid needs to be taking carpentry class, and as soon as he's old enough, be taking metalworking and welding. And I said, he can start soldering together electronic circuits and things like that now. At 11, he can do soldering. And his mother didn't even know what soldering was, so I explained about how I used to build Heath kits when I was a kid. That's fantastic. Um, Temple, do you mind if I ask you, as a mature autistic person, what do you think are the most important things that society could do uh, to support autistic people and their families for the future? That's almost too broad a question for me to answer. You see, I'm very specific in how I think. If it's a two-year-old or a three-year-old that's not talking, it's early intervention. Uh, or you can argue over which teaching method you use, but at least 20 hours a week, one-to-ones with an effective teacher, teaching turn-taking, teaching them how to eat, teaching them uh, words. Uh, now, as they get older, um, 
for the fully verbal kids, I want to see their abilities developed. If you got a third grader who's a little math genius, don't make them do baby third grade work. Get them more, uh, more complicated work to do. Develop the area of strength. The other big problem I'm seeing right now in the fully verbal end of the spectrum is kids are not learning any work skills. I am seeing kids graduating from college with a degree in philosophy. And they've never had any job, not even a volunteer job. Mother got me a job working for seamstress when I was 13 in the summer. And when I was 15, I took care of eight horses and cleaned their stalls every day. I was painting signs and selling them. I was learning working skills. And we need to be getting a lot of these kids into paper route substitutes in middle school. How about volunteer at the farmer's market? Walk dogs for the neighbors in your apartment complex and get, you know, paid a little bit for it. And you got to learn that discipline. you got to be up 6 o'clock every morning, take those two dogs out, and make sure they don't run away or have anything happen to them. One of the main uh, points that I make in my book is that, you know, we've spent like over a billion dollars in the last 10 years in this country searching for candidate genes for autism, and by the way, we found, you know, 600 to 1,000 of them, searching for environmental risk factors for autism, by the way, we found an ever-expanding list of them. The problem is that by investing in research on causes and causation, um, we think that we're dealing seriously with autism, and yet a Government Accountability Office report just came out in June, uh, reported that less than 2% of the funding of re scientific research is dedicated towards improving the lives of autistic adults. We don't even know how many autistic adults there are in America. Interestingly enough, in the UK, a guy did a, a very comprehensive survey recently and discovered that there were just as many autistic adults out there undiagnosed living in the community trying to get by as there were autistic kids. And that argues against the notion that autism is this very recent, you know, disorder of the disordered modern world. We need to understand that there are a lot of autistic adults out there who have never gotten a diagnosis, who have been struggling to get by. If they don't need a diagnosis, that's fine. But uh, for many people, in fact, I gave a, a book launch party the other night here in San Francisco, and an autistic woman stood up and said that getting a diagnosis was, quote-unquote, like finding the Rosetta Stone to herself. All right, let me and, mention something now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I am fine, uh, when I go to autism meetings and I do my talks, I'm finding many parents, well, you know, might have a parent's 50, 40s, 50s years old, get their kid diagnosed, and they find out they're on the spectrum. Now, one thing where they need to be doing research, and it would be my top research priority, and that's the sensory problems, the sensory yep. oversensitivity. They vary from being a nuisance. My sensory problems now are just a nuisance. I've been on a low dose of antidepressant drugs for ever since 81. I described that in my book, Thinking in Pictures. I, but there are some people that can't go to a restaurant because they can't stand the noise. Um, there needs to be way, good ways to treat these sensory issues because some of these sensory issues are so bad that the person is not able to tolerate normal environments such as restaurants or workplaces or, or whatever. And that would be my number one priority. What do we do about the sound sensitivity? That's one of the worst ones. Well, another, yes, uh, and another way to look at that is uh, recently there have been these autism-friendly showings of Broadway plays that have been very successful. Uh, you know, they don't use pyrotechnics. They distribute social stories before the performances so the kids don't get unpleasant surprises. And one thing that happens is that, you know, they do these pilot programs of autism-friendly uh, showings of movies or plays. There's always, like, unbelievable demand. And that's because the families have nowhere to take their kids where they can just relax. And, you know, if the kid needs to walk out into the aisle, you know, for a while, it's okay. And so uh, it's, I think it's all at the same time that we're working on treating, you know, sensory hypersensitivity, that we can also be making reasonable accommodations as we do for people who use wheelchairs. We build, you know, wheelchair accessible buildings. And as a society, we know how to make reasonable accommodations, but in part because autism is often misperceived as something so recent and something a purely medical problem, we don't look at it the same way.
Well, on the sensory issues, there's an interesting paper that's been published called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism, where you stimulate two senses at the same time. Like maybe the child might smell vanilla aromatherapy and touch carpet. And you're always changing these two senses that you stimulate. And some in little kids, if you work on some of these sensory issues, you can desensitize it somewhat. Because there are some individuals where they're so sensitive that even the sensory-friendly movie would be overstimulated. And that is extremely debilitating. So my top priority is working on ways to, um, uh, okay, young kids, it's probably going to be easier to treat it, but to understand some of these sensory issues because how can you be social if you can't stand going in the place that's social? Now, I much prefer, you know, much quieter restaurants. I can tolerate noisy restaurants, but I don't like them. Yeah, as I have to say, now that I'm like in my older middle age, even I can't stand noisy restaurants anymore, and I'm neurotypical. But yeah, I, I completely understand. Well, I, I can't. The problem I have is I've got some auditory processing, and in a noisy environment, I simply cannot hear. I am functionally deaf in a, no, in a really, really noisy uh, background when there's a lot of noise around. Temple, I, something um, that I, I had read described um, that I'd be interested in, um, your account of that one of the biggest challenges for people with autism is, is understanding uh, s social norms. And you, uh, just through a process of education, have been able to uh, adapt to social norms without fully, I guess, understanding them. Could you Well, explain? you just learn. Like, I dress kind of eccentric. <laughs> but there's a scene in the HBO movie about me where the boss slams down the deodorant and says, you stink, use it. That happened. You just can't be a filthy, dirty slob. You have to make some things to be social. You can't walk up to people and just call them swear words or something like that. And and I learned through experience. When I was eight years old, uh, mother had me be party hostess. And I had to shake hands with the guests, serve the snacks, and take their coats. And that taught important social skills. Also helped my brother, who's neurotypical, become a bank vice president because he knew how to talk to the high up vice presidents above it when he was just a young banker. You know, well, this is some of the 50s upbringing because I'm finding a lot of people my age now coming out of the woodwork that are getting diagnosed at a really late age. They managed to have decent jobs. And then Junior today is getting addicted to video games and, and not learning working skills. And I have a, I'm very concerned about that. Another thing is that, you know, sometimes because I've become associated with the notion of accepting autism rather than, you know, considering it as some sort of horrible plague of modern times, uh, people say, well, shouldn't we be helping uh, autistic people who have health problems? Absolutely. One of the most difficult health problems that autistic people deal with is uh, seizures. And in fact, it's the leading cause of death that's related to autism is seizures. And um, uh, Lorna Wing's daughter, Susie, suffered seizures. And, you know, it, it's possible to invest in medical research around autism without stigmatizing autism as this runaway epidemic and without stigmatizing autistic people. We well, can I, would still, totally, it, I would totally agree with that. This Skype would not even be here if it wasn't for autism genetics. Who do you think invents Skype? Right. No, I know. One of the, that's one of the main themes of my book is that, in a sense, the profound truth uh, hidden in autism history is that certain forms of genius and certain forms of disability are inextricably intertwined uh, in the human genome. And so, you know, the Nazis tried to get rid of people with hereditary disabilities. And uh, in the ca particularly in the case of autism, that could be very dangerous because uh, we could purge the very genes from the human gene pool that... Uh, yeah, I would totally agree with that. There was a new. I got called up by the uh, Reuters or written email from the Reuters reporter about a study on creativity, and that people on the autism spectrum they'll think of the really unique use for a single brick or a single paperclip. And he didn't publish my use for the single paperclip. But you remember on the old Microsoft Word how they had that horrid little clippy paper clip that veered at you. Yes. Stupid, you don't know how to use this computer. <laughs> well, I'd make little clippies out of them and then put little eyes from the craft store on them. That was my use for a single paperclip. I don't know if that's creative or not. <laughs> you guys have both uh, used the term neurotypical 
But could you talk about, I guess, um, well, neuro, the neurodiversity well, movement and where, like, how far should that extend? You know, I'm someone thing, who... The thing about, I'm sorry about interrupting, this is where I have trouble with okay. the rhythm of the, of the language. Uh, there's a point where my old sort of Asperger autism traits, you know, geeks and nerds, becomes a personality variant. I think it's a true continuum. When is geeky and nerdy then going to get get a label? Uh, it, it's a continuous trait. Yeah, one of the uh, most poignant things, and subversive things, actually, that Lorna Wing said to me, Lorna being the mother of the autism spectrum, um, she said, the spectrum shades imperceptibly into eccentric normality. In other words, there's no, there are no traits that autistic people have that no neurotypical people have. And so, in a sense, we're all on the spectrum. On the other hand, um, you know, Jerry Seinfeld going to see Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime and saying, hey, I'm on the spectrum. I don't know if Jerry Seinfeld, I mean, maybe he's struggling in ways that I can't see, but there is a point when extending the spectrum infinitely becomes kind of absurd because you're not paying attention to the very serious problems like seizures and like unemployment and like lack of access to health care. You know, the very ser serious problems that autistic people who are profoundly uh, disabled and their families are dealing with. So once the spectrum just becomes this kind of buzzword where we see, oh, yes, everybody's on the spectrum, I then we're not, you know. I would agree with that. I mean, there's like these really hyper-social people. Uh, they definitely are not on the spectrum. But I'm talking about the kind of more shy, geeky nerds like my grandfather, MIT-trained engineer, co-inventor of the automatic pilot for airplanes. He worked with a guy named Andrew Nickian, who came up with an idea of a coil, three coils that would detect a magnetic field. And everybody thought Andrew Nickian was crazy. He probably was Asperger. And my yeah. grandfather and Andrew Nickian and other people worked in a loft over a train, a trolley car run maintenance uh, building and worked on making the, um, the flux valve for the automatic pilot. And he was kind of a shy guy. And when he got old, he used to like just sit and read Scientific American. But I loved to go visit him. And when I was a little child, I'd go, Grandfather, why is the sky blue? And he'd spend half an hour explaining it. That's wonderful. Do you want to uh, just, just talk about the um, the neuro tribes idea and the way that the uh, the geeks and nerds have, have built uh, this platform? That yeah, allowed? sure. Um, one way that Asperger was prescient was that he saw autistic people as always being part of the human community and as uh, quietly accelerating the evolution of science, technology, and culture uh, all along. And I think we know now more than ever that that's true. Um, as long as we continue to see autism as only an affliction um, and something to, a, a puzzle to be solved, you know, my autistic friends hate that puzzle piece symbol because they don't feel like puzzles to be solved. They feel like full human beings. And Temple, you know, one of the most beautiful things about Oliver's profile of you in The New Yorker was that at a time when autistic people were considered incapable of humor and sub subterfuge, you know, he wrote about how you had him put on a, a hard hat to enter a plant, you know, he, without even sort of saying all this stuff that my colleagues think about autism is wrong, he just presented you, you know, as a full human being with passions and, you know, they weren't the same passions that he had, but, you know, you... You, he expressed your being in the full breadth of your humanity. Well, he and got, by doing that... He really got inside my head in just an amazing way. And it was... I, I, I have my little acts of defiance. I dressed... We dressed up as maintenance people. I had this blue coverall that had the Swift logo on it. I put that on. I had an old hard hat with the name of the company. I gave Oliver another hard hat. He put on this brown coverall he happened to have with him. And we just rolled up to that gate and we said we were with the equipment company and we had to work on the equipment. And um, they let us in. And I loved it. <laughs> that, that, that is fantastic. I, I'm, this is almost a, pers almost a personal question, perhaps too personal. But uh, Temple, I'm curious. Did Oliver ever come out to you as gay before he died? No, he did not. Uh, this is something I knew absolutely nothing about. 
uh, until I, till after, uh, actually, I didn't hear about it till after he died. Unfortunately, I hadn't read the, the final book. Oh, yeah. And I heard about it after his death on, on NPR while driving. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's where I heard it. Yeah. And that was, you know, the reason why he was so uptight about it was because when he came out to his mom when he was still a teenager, she said, I wish you had never been born. Oh, so I'm... bullying, yes. and, and, and that was an act of bullying on her part, can carry a, a lifelong uh, traumatic effect, actually. Well, and I read the editorial about the Sabbath. Alan, yeah. I was keeping so hard at the computer, they couldn't even work the mouse to get it printed. Yeah. Uh, especially when it got to the part about his life. What if A becomes B becomes C? You know, he had two choices. He could become an observant Jew, or he could he would got into his writing and led the life that he led. And he would have never met me. Uh, he wouldn't have affected my life. He would not have affected so many lives if he'd if he had um, you know decided to take a different path. But then he did write about how much he enjoyed the peacefulness of the Sabbath. Um, but that article, um, I was just uh, weeping when I read that article, and I um, I, uh, I wrote him wrote to him on a card about the meaning of life and that he um, he helped uh, so many people. Absolutely, he helped me too. Well. I think this might be a good place to wrap up. Uh, thank you both so much. It's been a really fantastic discussion. Steve Silverman, congratulations on the book, Neurotribes, The History of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity. And Temple Grandin, thank you for your dedication to promoting human rights and, of course, animal rights as well. Well, you have to work hard to try to you know, make the world a better place. That is something that all of us did. He enlightened uh, so many people. I'm glad that he, when he did A, goes to B to C, that he took the path that he took. And I'm just about crying right now. Absolutely. And even though he was not an observant Jew, he did a very traditional Jewish thing, which was to devote, to devote his life to what's called tikkun olam, which is healing the broken world. And Oliver really did uh, help to heal the broken world in ways that benefited both Temple and I. Well, and everybody, and many, many other people, too. I mean, his books will live on. You know, when I was a graduate student, now I'm really getting choked up. When I was a graduate student at University of Illinois, I had this thing I cut out of the New York Times about someone said libraries are where immortality is. And I've had that on my bookcase at the University of Illinois, and I still have it on the wall. And that, that is so his writings will live on. That's beautiful.